and get rolling. So a few announcements. First of all, when you're sending stuff in, a reminder to put your name in the file name. Like, we don't need stoplight project, you know, 12 copies of it, all named stoplight project or some variation of that. So your first name, your last name, either one, something. But put your name in all files that you send us. It makes life much easier. Um, the parts list for your projects is due by 5 o'clock today. So if you want us to buy you parts, we need to have the list by five, otherwise you get to buy them yourself. So everything that you think you're going to need for your project, send us the part numbers and or the link of where to get it, and we'll order it. So make sure you send us you know, raw material. We've got a lot of screws and things in the lab. If you don't know what's up there, go look or ask somebody. Uh, but. At 5 o'clock today, we'll compile the list and give it to Steve, and he will start placing the orders. So we're just going to do one big order. So make sure you've got everything in there. Okay. Uh, and the other thing, on the 3D prints, I know some people have already got their 3D print back from the library. How many people have already got their print from 1, 2, 3, 4? Okay, so four people. Uh, Apparently, the library recommends that you print with a 3% infill because they're cheap. They're really, really cheap. I did not know you could print with a 3% infill successfully, ever. Uh, I print at 10%, and that's for parts that I'm going to throw away. They're just to check the dimensioning. For parts like what I showed you, something like this, this is printed at 30% infill so that it's got some rigidity to it. I know Carrie's part came back, and you can see through parts of it. The infill is so low. So go at least 10, 15% infill, and if they give you too much trouble about it, let us know. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, I mean, anything over probably 40% is not useful, but 30% is a pretty good number for hard parts. So yeah, somewhere in there. Uh, if you have any other problems, let us know, but several people have printed and the turnaround time has been what, roughly overnight at the next day? Yeah, so a day or two. But don't forget, so that's due next week. So if you haven't submitted your print, you need to do that so it's not late. Okay, any questions on things that we've done up to this point, your projects, your parts lists. Five o'clock today, we'll have one from everybody. I've got one from like four people right now. Okay. So this is going to be a really short bit of slides, and then we'll go to an in-class activity uh, that you'll do for the rest of the period, and then whatever you don't get done will be homework after that. Uh, so this is going to be a a really practical section because we're going to talk about pressure vessels and how to design them. Uh, and pressure vessels are something that we have everywhere uh, in the lab. So you know, we have an air compressor. We do have one that's up on the roof, uh, but that's obviously a pressure vessel. There are experimental pressure vessels like our triacs or like these PAR pressure cells that a lot of geochemical reactions happen in. Uh, this is another large experimental pressure vessel. And then these are the compressed gas tanks that we have several of. And those are generally, I think about 2,300, something like that PSI. They're a little over 2,000 PSI. Uh, they store a lot of energy. And I'll show you uh, a little bit later kind of how much. But all of these things were engineered to safely store the maximum working pressure plus some factor of safety, plus probably some material defects, some welding deratings, that kind of thing. And when you're designing pressure vessels, a lot of times you will use a tool like SolidWorks and Onshape. There is a, a web app that you can integrate with Onshape. I don't remember the name of it at this moment, but it's a simulation tool where you can design your pressure vessel, pressurize it, and it will show you where there's any stress concentrations, if you're going to fail the material, what the stress at every point is. And that's really important because if you have things like a lot of ports or a lot of openings, that can make doing analytical solutions impossible uh, or very difficult, maybe not that accurate. 
Uh, but this is Chris's copy of this book. Uh, you can get this edition used online for less than a buck on Amazon. Uh, there are two editions since then. The newest edition, this one has one author. The newest edition has three and is about 30% thicker. Uh, it's also almost $200 if you buy it. Uh, but it has a lot of more textbook style information in it, whereas this is tables of formulas and not a whole lot of explanation. You kind of need to know what you're looking for in here. But there are a lot of solutions, for example, for bending of flat plates, plates that are supported on one end, that are clamped, that are uh, simply supported with uniform loading, point loading, loading around the perimeter, any kind of situation you can imagine. There's a table in here. You can look up the formulas and figure out how to calculate the stress at any point on that plate and calculate things like the deflection of the plate, which is really important because you can imagine when you're pressurizing a pressure vessel, you don't want it to have large dimensional changes and you don't want to pass the yield strength of the material either. Uh, so pick up a copy of this for under a buck and it's handy to have on your shelf. One of the things that the, you can find in the book we're not going to talk about very much today at all and in your problem set we're going to simplify is the head geometry of the pressure vessels. Most of the pressure vessels we have in the lab are flathead geometry, but if you notice things like a compressed air tank have those domed ends and the hemispherical heads or elliptical heads. And those actually you can get away with a little bit thinner material when you're optimizing your design, but the solutions for those are a little bit more complex. So there's a channel on YouTube called Applied Science. It's this guy, Ben Krasnow, who worked, possibly still works for Google and does science in his spare time in what has to be one of the best equipped garages in the US. Uh, he has a lot of equipment, but he has several videos where he builds pressure vessels. I think I've got, yeah, so here's a picture of one. This has an aluminum ring, and then there are two pieces of very thick acrylic that are bolted on either side. Notice the O-ring seal, like we talked about last week, and also notice this tearing up here, so that's maybe not the best seal choice and seal gland design. Ah. What this does is he was making supercritical CO2 to experiment with decaffeinating coffee beans, because that's how coffee beans are commonly decaffeinated, is using supercritical CO2 as a solvent. Uh, so what he would do is put a piece of dry ice in here, seal this up. In the process of sealing it up while the dry ice was sublimating, uh, he had some O-ring blowout and has all kinds of other fun stuff that happened to this pressure vessel. You can go watch it on his channel. You can see supercritical CO2 and all kinds of cool phase transformations. And then he also built this larger vessel, which is a little bit more like what you're going to design in the activity that we'll do here shortly. So this is a tube with a welded plug at the end, and then a cap with a, a pressure port, and then this clamp to seal it all down. Now, this is a long tube design because, as you'll see, when you're solving for like the hoop stress on one of these pressure vessels, the length, if it's a cylindrical pressure vessel, doesn't make any difference. So he could extend this tube to be eight feet long and have a much long, higher volume if he wished without having to change the material or the wall thickness or anything like that. Uh, this is just to demonstrate, maybe scare you a little bit, maybe not, about the amount of energy stored in pressure vessels. Uh, we go up to numbers like 70 MPA in a pressure vessel in the laboratory, and 70 is a number, and you crank it into the machine, you don't really think about it. But when you actually calculate how many pounds force that is bearing down on the door of the pressure vessel or on the end of the pressure vessel, it's a very large and kind of terrifying number. You should be responsible with that amount of energy. So this video, it's pretty short. Uh, gas cylinders are, one of the, as I said, one of the common things we have in the lab. And they have this protective cap on the top, but we remove that cap and add a regulator and whatever equipment we have to get the gas to our experimental setup. Uh, but if that were to be knocked over, that's why we chain them to the wall, and that regulator gets blown off, 
uh, they turn into rockets in a, a pretty dramatic fashion. And this is even not even all that large of a pressure vessel, really. Except when YouTube doesn't work. Excuse me, we have a class going on in here. So that's a pretty large, for the laboratory, pressure vessel. Um, it can contain a lot of energy and be pretty dangerous. Even the smaller pressure vessels that we have that go up to very high pressures can still do a lot of bodily harm if something were to happen. Now, the other thing is, a lot of things that you don't think about as being pressure vessels are, and that can have a lot of unintended consequences. So things like hydraulic hoses or pressure vessels, you would calculate uh, their rating, you know, when they're going to explode, just as you would uh, with the pressure activity that we're going to today. Fire extinguishers, aerosol cans are a big one. If you look at the bottom of the aerosol can, you'll notice it has that domed head. It actually faces inward instead of outward, so it's easier to stand. But if you look through Ark's book and look at the formulas, you'll see why they use that design. Uh, your coffee tumbler, I know people, we've even had a couple people in here at different times that have had water bottles or coffee tumblers that you hear sucking air in or pushing air out because of a pressure differential to the fluid is heating or cooling. Uh, obvious things like pressure cookers and car tires, Pillsbury Grand's biscuits, how many people have jumped when they open that <laughs> and release the pressure. Uh, one that very few people think about our instruments, things like seismometers, anything that you have an instrument in a case, generally you try to seal it to be weatherproof if it's going to go outside or at least dustproof for working in the laboratory. Uh, when you do that seal, you make it a pressure vessel. You're trapping some atmospheric pressure inside. If you do something like put that on an airliner for transport or if the temperature changes dramatically in the room or inside the equipment, say electronics heat up, you can actually get pretty large pressure differentials that can do things like even extrude the O-ring out. So all of these cases, you need to have some way to vent them. And that's something that's very important in all pressure vessels, is you need to have a vent. Right, and so we'll do another short video here. And then we've got a total of about two more slides, and then you'll get started on your activities. This one's from Mythbusters. It's a couple minutes long. But I will let it play. The idea is later on, you can see they, they implode one of these large tank cars, like you would see going down the railway something that has a very thick steel skin just with atmospheric pressure on the outside. So does anybody know what the standard atmospheric pressure is? 100 atmospheres. So one, one atmosphere, okay, yeah. Well, in, in real units, right? So what is that in, like, Pascals? So it's 101,325 Pascals is one standard atmosphere. That's a number that you need to keep in mind when you're doing a lot of these designs. We have an ad. <laughs> so atmospheric pressure is a pressure we don't think about a lot because we're, we're used to it. But it can do some pretty extreme things to pressure vessels. SpaceX ran into this exact problem 
with one of their rockets when they were transporting in an aircraft and actually crushed the fuel tank in the rocket. So they do the same thing with a 55 gallon drum, but we're going to skip a little bit. And so that's just atmospheric pressure pressing in from the outside, so it's definitely something to consider in your designs. No matter what you're doing with a pressure vessel, you should always have some kind of a safety blowout device on it, so you can't overpressurize until the vessel explodes or implodes, because that would be very bad for the pressure vessel and who's ever near it, most likely. There are several varieties of these. I meant to bring some burst disks from the lab. I'll try to remember to do that next week so you can see them if you haven't. The idea is there's these metal discs that you clamp in between these fittings and when the pressure gets to a certain set point, the metal disc will break and the vessel depressurizes very rapidly. So you, in theory, burst that before you burst the vessel. Another type would be kind of this, uh, the pop-off valve where you can adjust the spring tension on this. So you would take the vessel up to the point where you want the pop-off valve to go adjust the tension on it until the pressure pushes up on this and lets the vessel vent. These are mechanical, they have a lot more moving parts, maybe not quite as reliable. The rupture disc is going to fail every time where it should. I don't know, Chris, did you have any other venting things? I mean, it, we use rupture disc for almost everything in the lab. I don't know if anything that we've got that has a pop-off valve on it. Uh, the other thing, I put these formulas up here, but they're going to be online for reference. The main thing is you should always design with some factor of safety in mind. Generally for pressure vessels, 
you design for three to four times the expected maximum pressure that your vessel will work at. So that'd be a factor of safety of three or four. Uh, sometimes you can get away with two, but for pressure vessels, we generally err on the high side of that. Whereas in aerospace, things like rockets, airplanes, all that, their factor of safety is generally slightly less than two or right around two because it's a weight concern and they're using very expensive materials. If you had, a, if you had an airplane that had a factor of safety of three, it would never get off the ground. Everything would be too big and too expensive. But for laboratory pressure vessels, three to four is a pretty good rule of thumb for the factor of safety. Sometimes you'll people, see people talk about the margin of safety or different terms. They're there in case you need them. Okay, so I already reminded you about the 3D printing activity, so we're not going to do that again. But the activity that you're going to do for the next 50 minutes or so, and then whatever you don't finish will be homework, uh, is you're going to design a pressure vessel because I could put the equations up here and go through all the terms and you don't learn anything from that. So you're actually going to do a design from scratch. And what you're going to design is a pressure vessel to manufacture methane hydrate. So does anybody know about methane hydrate? Has heard of methane hydrate or clathrate? A couple people? Okay. The idea is you have a methane gas molecule that is in this cage of water molecules. So it looks sort of like ice, but you can light it on fire. And it's been explored as an energy source, a methane reservoir. There were people that thought for a while it was important in climate change. There's what's called the clathrate gun hypothesis. It's important for the stability of slopes on the seafloor, and it's really important for industrial drilling operations because if you hit an unexpected methane pocket, things can go bad very quickly if you destabilize all of the clathrate. During the Deepwater Horizon incident, back several years ago now, I guess, uh, they tried a solution that was called the top hat. This is a picture of the top hat. They were going on to set this on top of the well that was spurting everything out into the Gulf and it ended up floating off the top of the wellhead, which doesn't seem possible for this huge steel structure. What happened was there was methane gas in what was coming out of the well. The pressure was high enough and the temperature was low enough that methane clathrate was stable and the entire top of this top hat filled with methane clathrate, which is less dense than water, and it floated the entire assembly to the surface. So it didn't work at all. There are a lot of people that do this in the laboratory for a living. They look at stability of methane clathrate. So there's a link to this in the activity, but I was going to put it up here so you can see. Does everybody feel comfortable reading a PT diagram to see where you are in phase space? Yeah, so here you've got methane hydrate ice and methane gas and methane hydrate water and gas. And in the activity, you're going to design a pressure vessel that will let you make methane clathrate using the laboratory refrigerator which runs at about two degrees Celsius, let's say. So two degrees Celsius, you can come here and see approximately what pressure you need to be at, at a minimum, to make methane clathrate. On the website, under the lab exercises, there's pressure vessel design activity. So here it is, it's got the requirements stated, a little bit of background, some links, because you'll need things like the periodic table and a reminder about the ideal gas law if you need that. Uh, and then there are some questions and design tasks. So we'll be here to help you for the rest of the period. This is due next Tuesday at the beginning of class.